Hello everyone, and welcome to this first webinar in the Baby Steps webinar series, The Heart of a Good Story is You. I'm Ali Bizdikian, and joining us here today, we're very excited to have Matthew Rowe from Dirty Robber to discuss a little bit more about why storytelling and why it's so important for you as a storyteller to be empowered in particular ways to capture and show your organization's mission and practice. Here at TechSoup, we believe that storytelling not only builds, but is also the currency of community. These images are the winning photo submissions of TechSoup's annual digital storytelling competition, where for the last four years we've been able to cultivate a community of nonprofits and storytellers that are now out there contributing rich content to the various landscapes and communities they touch. What do you think about when you see these images? What do you, where do you go? What emotions do you feel? Understanding the heart of a good story leads to better content, better visibility, visibility of your message, and of the work that you are doing in the field. I'm really very excited to be discussing all of these really exciting concepts coming up in a few minutes. But before I get ahead of myself, I did just want to back up and take a moment to acknowledge our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, whose platform makes all of our webinars possible. If you are connected to audio by phone, Please note that all lines are muted, so if you have a question or comment, please share those with us in that lower left-hand chat box window where Becky will be capturing your questions as we go along. If you lose your connection at all today, uh, don't worry. You can simply reconnect using the confirmation e email that was sent to you before this event, or dial the number that Becky will chat out right now. This webinar is being recorded and will be sent out to all of you later today with the slides and all of the resources and links we discuss. Um, if you hear something worth sharing uh, on this webinar today, tweet it out at TechSoup or at Dirty Robber using the hashtag BabyStepsComp. Again, I am Ali Bezdikian. I am an interactive events and video producer here at TechSoup Global where I work with Becky Wiegand on chat to program educational events like this and help produce our digital content. I've been at TechSoup for two years, and before this I got my start uh, in nonprofit communications as a fellow at Mother Jones Magazine here in San Francisco, having studied broadcast journalism in university. Also on the call today, we are so thrilled to have the talented Matthew Rowe, um, Matt, it's really great to have you with us today. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I was hoping um, maybe you, know, you can start off by telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you do at Dirty Robber, but then uh, we'll get it more, more into um, what we're all working towards with the Baby Steps Campaign for Early Childhood Education. You know, we'll discuss your own process of story making with the banner film for the campaign, and then really get into the why of storytelling. Uh, Matt, if you want to take it away. Absolutely. Um, so uh, my role at Betty Robert is I am a junior creative director, which is uh, essentially a fancy term to mean I write. Um, what we do at Betty Robert is a company that does um, specializes in short form content. Um, and commercials, we do branded content, we do short films. Uh, we were actually nominated for uh, an Oscar this year for a short film that we did called The Scotty Boys, which is set in Afghanistan. Uh, and so my role at Dirty Robert is to generate ideas with uh, the other creatives and directors to execute on those ideas to develop scripts, develop pitch packets, anything that goes into the creation of one of our projects. Um, so that's sort of my role at Dirty Robber. Uh, what we've done, the mission we've done is this baby steps competition that Ali mentioned just, just a second ago. Uh, we have done in partnership with uh, Further by Design, uh, the Kellogg's Foundation, uh, the Bay Area Council and, and TechSoup. Um, and the petition 
is about early childhood development, which is the age uh, of the children between zero and five. Uh, that statistically is the largest period of growth that we go through as people. We love a particular period of time. Competition. Hey, Matt, if I could just jump in for a brief moment. Uh, we're losing you on the audio a little bit, I think. You're going in and out. Okay, I'm not sure. What, let me, I'm on my landline, so I'm not sure what to do. Let me see if this helps at all. Is this any better? It, it, was, it sounded a little bit better briefly, but keep talking. Okay, sorry about that. If, if it keeps happening, let me know, and, and I will simply repeat uh, what I'm saying. Great. Um, so the competition is designed to have uh, uh, parents, educators, caregivers, uh, family members to film themselves interacting with their with their child or with their student or, or with their family member um, and showing us how they interact with their child in a unique and specific way that helps uh, engage the child. Uh, what we wanted to do with the video was essentially raise awareness, raise awareness of early childhood development, raise awareness of it as a concept, and most importantly, raise awareness of how critical it can be in helping our, our children grow to be healthy and, and successful uh, adults. Um, we actually have the video here. I'm going to load up for, you, for us in just a second to watch. It's only two minutes long. And what, what I think is a good idea here is if we watch the video and then I will speak about the sort of generation of the video, about how we, how we developed it, how we came to this place and sort of maybe walk through the process that we went through to, to get to this video. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and load that up now. And like I say, it'll take about two minutes to play, so just, uh, just give it a watch, and, and then we'll talk about it right after. You can't remember, but there was a time When you couldn't walk. When just trying to was an adventure. But sometimes was a step too far. You can't remember but someone helped you, picked you up, comforted you, helped you take your first step. This winter, Invest Early invites parents, families, caregivers, and educators nationwide to answer one question. This is what I do with my child. What do you do with yours? The Baby Steps competition asks you to submit videos that capture a snapshot of how we care for children during the first five years of their lives. For parents and families, we're looking for short videos taken by iPhone or by camera. Whatever you have that's able to capture the simple, everyday things you do with your child or family member. For care providers and teachers, we want to help you generate videos by capturing all the creative things you do to inspire your students. Whether it's reading, singing, playing, or coloring. The Baby Steps competition will be running from December 2nd to February 2nd and will be recognizing winners based on four criteria. Their emotional value, their educational value, the creativity of the activity, and the quality of the video. Go to babystepscompetition.com to learn more about how to enter and see why we believe the first five years of a child's life are vital to invest in. So that uh, is the, the banner video for the competition. 
the, the announcement video, if you like, for the competition and, and its dates and, and how to enter and, and all that sort of critical information. Um, so what I'd like to do now, as I said, is maybe, maybe talk about the process of how uh, we arrived at that video. Um, so one of the very first things to bear in mind when crafting a story is that very often uh, you are not crafting your own story. And by that, I mean you are working with and for other people. And very often what you are dealing with is you're dealing with uh, multiple bosses, for want of a, a better phrase. You're, you're working with various groups who all have information, uh, all have a vested interest in the story or in the, the project itself. And so one of your very, very first jobs as the crafter of the story is to identify what needs to be said. And I know that that sounds maybe slightly redundant, but when, you're, when you are dealing with sort of multiple people and, and multiple groups, uh, it's really, really the critical first step to get everybody on the same page to agree to what the story is that you're telling. Because without that, you end up going around in circles. You, it's very hard to make sure that everybody is being represented. It's very hard to take all this information and turn it into a, a compelling and emotionally engaging story. So the very first step, once you've, once you've sort of assessed the lay of the land with, with the various elements involved, this is literally the most critical step. You have to identify a clarity of purpose right? Without sounding too much like it's marketing, you essentially have to identify what it is that your story is selling, right? What is the concept? What is the message? What is the, what is the point of the story being told? So with uh, the Baby Steps competition, with the video that you guys just watched uh, in particular, what we were dealing with in early childhood development is an incredibly complex uh, philosophy. It is a very broad, uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, sort of way of looking at how to deal with children at that age. And so the initial conversations that we had with the various partners, with the various elements, uh, there was a lot of discussion about what part of early childhood development are we going to focus on, how are we going to best communicate the complexity of, of the philosophy. And the worry there is that you get bogged down in trying to relate too much information and never ever getting people engaged. So one of the very first steps that we as a team took that, that was such a, a huge step forward for us to be able to make that video is we agreed upon a single purpose of the video. It wasn't necessarily to, to jump into the various sort of mechanisms of early childhood development to, to discuss in detail or in length uh, some of the, the issues of it because you couldn't in a two-minute video. What we wanted to do was raise awareness of early childhood development as a concept to the general public because it's easy to forget when you're, when you're embroiled in, in a story, when you're, when you're dealing with a particular thing, that very often by the time you get to writing or crafting the story, you have a pretty good understanding of it. But when you came into the project, you probably didn't. And you've got to remember that most of the people that will be watching your story or engaging with your story, they don't have that. They're like you when you first started working on the project. They don't necessarily have the breadth of information that you do now. So it was one of the great moments for us when we were developing this video is when we all came to the realization that, that if we are simply trying to raise awareness of the importance of early childhood development, that as a single point of focus allows us to do so much more than trying to incorporate multiple different uh, uh, purposes, for, for want of a better phrase. So the very first thing we did with clarity of purpose. Now, once you have your clarity of purpose with your story, what is the story supposed to do, yeah? It allows you to look at who you want to watch the story. Because, again, when, when trying to craft a story that people are going to watch, 
knowing the kind of people that are going to watch it is critical to how you end up writing the story. So when we realized that we were trying to raise awareness of what early childhood development was, it was a pretty easy jump to go from that to parents, to educators, to caregivers, to family members, because these are the people that are not only going to, to care the most about early childhood development, but ultimately are the very people responsible for early childhood development. So once we had the purpose to raise awareness, finding our audience became that much easier. Now, now before we even put pen to paper on writing our story, we have two of the three key criteria uh, uh, mapped out. We know what we're trying to do, and we know who we're going to try and te tell our story to. So once you've got those two elements locked in, the third element, and this is, a very, this, this is the big one for me, is the simplicity of the story, okay? Uh, it, it can become very easy to get wrapped up in trying to be clever with how you communicate your story, with how you tell your message. Um, and very often you can find yourself, especially I find when you, when you first, start writing um, um, you know, stories or, or crafting messages, it's so, so easy to get caught up in uh, how clever you can be or how, how the unique way that you can tell this story. That's fine, but none of that matters unless your story itself, the nuts and bolts of the story, is really, really simple to follow. So if we look at the banner video that we just watched, right, it's broken essentially into two components. The first, so it's 55 seconds to a minute, tell the story of a child walking towards camera, right? It is the simplest story you could imagine. So once, to, to give you a genesis of how we got to that point, the simplicity of that, once we had the clarity of purpose, we wanted, we wanted to raise awareness of what early childhood development is and, and how it impacts what it can be, once we knew who we wanted to watch this video, who we wanted to engage this video with, um, and ultimately who we wanted to have entered the competition, developing a story that would, that would capitalize on those two things became about simplicity. Because for us, the competition, the Baby Steps competition, is about Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm getting caught up. Early childhood development is about helping children from zero to five. You are talking about taking the very first step uh, in, a, in, in nurturing and growing a child, right? And so with that imagery and with that language and with that sort of uh, discussion going on amongst the creative group and coming to the conclusion that the, the competition was called the Baby Steps Competition, it occurred to us that literally showing a child taking their very first baby step, the simplicity of that would be a really great way of introducing this much larger concept of early childhood development. So the story of this child walking towards camera, falling over, and their mom coming in and, and helping them, right, that is a very simple story. Uh, the reason why that's so important for us is because the simpler the story, the more you allow the, the emotion of the story, the more you allow the, the purpose of the story to become the dominant factor. You aren't trying to be clever. You aren't trying to, uh, to show off. You are, you are, in a way, getting out of the way of the story and allowing the power and the beauty of this moment of this child walking to be the story itself. It's by, by going that route, by making it that simple, it becomes, for my money, that much more engaging. Um, yeah, Matt, what you so, said right there I think is really powerful. Oftentimes as storytellers, you know, you need to know when to move out of the way of the story. <laughs> I think that's a really powerful concept. Absolutely. And it's, it, it's a very much a, a learned skill. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, that you have to you have to trust at some juncture you have to trust that the work that you've done that the story that you you developed and obviously you 
you almost never develop these things in a vacuum. You're working with other people. So the team of people that, that have developed this idea, that are executing this idea, at some juncture you have to trust that that's correct. You know? And once you get to that place and you step out of the way and you allow the story to unfold, uh, I think you end up almost always with, with the strongest examples of storytelling. Um, so I just want to recap ever so quickly um, on, on, for me, the, the three critical areas of, of storytelling, and in particular, short-form storytelling, is you have to identify clarity of purpose. You are going to be working with multiple groups, multiple people, everybody bringing their own uh, ideas and opinions to the table. And as the sort of crafter of the story, your very, very first job is to, to disseminate all those various voices and help guide them into a single focused voice. This is the goal of our story. Yeah? Once you've done that, it becomes so much simpler then to look at that, that goal. What is our goal? Okay, if our goal is, in our case, to raise awareness, finding the audience becomes so much simpler. Now we have our goal, raise awareness, we find the audience, the people we want to be aware of the topic. In this case, it was, as I said, educators, parents, caregivers. But, but you know, whatever, whatever story you'd be working on, once you have the clarity, you find the audience. Now, once those two things are locked in, the next, next step, and this is the biggest step, the hardest step, and ultimately the most important step, you have to allow the story a level of simplicity. That doesn't mean that you can't be innovative in the way you tell the story. Uh, in, in a moment, I'm going to talk about a few other um, commercials that I haven't, I didn't write sadly, but are very successful commercials that, that are innovative whilst telling simple stories. You can be innovative in your approach, and often that will come in partnership with, you know, uh, if you're making a video, it will come in partnership with the director, if you are writing a story with the editor. Um, how you tell your story is a separate question. But the story itself, the more successful stories, are the ones that are simple, that allow the story to be the uh, dominant factor. Okay? So those, for me, are the three key areas of telling particularly short-form stories uh, and are certainly the rules that we use when developing the, the banner video for the Baby Steps competition. Um, I'm going to talk about right now a, a pretty unique uh, part of the, the, the experience that I just went through on the Baby Steps competition, and it, it sort of reinforces why, why it's important to have those three steps I just talked about. When we were shooting this video, we were obviously working with a lot of children. You saw that there were you know, upwards of 15 to 20 children uh, that we filmed for that spot. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are parents or, or, or interact daily with children, but um, from zero to five, children can be um, unpredictable, shall we say. Uh, and obviously, when you're working uh, on a set uh, with a finite amount of time and a very clear um, goal in mind about what you want to achieve, uh, it can be a little nerve-wracking when, you know, the, the children turn up because they're going to do whatever they're going to do. And that's great, and that's what you want. You want that spontaneity. You want that, that joy of life that only a child brings, uh, brings to you. So, again, w one of the reasons why we were so rigid about simplicity of story, about making sure that we didn't get too clever with what we were trying to do, was that, it, that meant that when the children came and we, we were filming them and they were, they were doing what they were doing, when they, when they ended up doing whatever it is that they wanted to do because they're little children and, and you know, they're going to do what they're going to do, it was okay because we had set the parameters up so that no matter what the child did, if the child walked towards camera, great. If the child couldn't walk towards camera, he could only stumble, great. If the child couldn't walk at all but only crawled, that's fine as well. The point being is that we had created the parameters that allowed us to, to stay very focused on telling a simple story and that whatever the child gave us would still work within those parameters. Um, that was just a, a very unique experience. You know, they, they say you never work with, uh, with pets and, and children. I, I seem to only ever work with pets and children, and I find it to be the most fun you can have. So I think, I think they're lying. Um, but 
you know, they, they, they can be a little bit unpredictable. And so, again, the more simple the story, the more, the more focused you are going into the, to the, um, the execution of the story, the more focused you are on what you're trying to do, on who you're trying to reach, and how simple you can make it, when inevitably things arise. And obviously, for this, for this particular video, it was children, but if you are working on a different story or if you are you know, making a commercial or something, there are always going to be exact moments that you can't possibly prepare for. Um, and that's why it's so critical, so, so, so critical to have those three things locked in. Clarity of purpose, know your audience, simple story. Those three things will allow you to, to surf over any waves that come uh, unexpectedly. Um, so I want to move away from the, the video, the, the uh, Baby Steps competition, because obviously that's a very specific focus. Uh, and I want to sort of talk a little more broadly uh, about storytelling and about uh, how to do successful storytelling. We are obviously living in an era where um, the web is becoming essentially our, our go-to source for, for almost all information. Um, you know, the, the, there's more and more uh, uh, TV and, and film that's being directed towards the web. Obviously, Netflix is exploding with its own content. Hulu, Amazon, Instant Video are doing their own content. The web is becoming our sort of our, uh, where we live for story. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting over the last few years, and obviously because where I work, we, we, we sort of specialize on short-form content, uh, what I've noticed is that traditional commercials are dying very rarely on things like Hulu, on things like Amazon Instant Video, on YouTube, do you watch 30-second commercials. More and more what you're seeing is you're seeing minute-long commercials or sometimes 90-second two-minute-long commercials. Um, I watched the Super Bowl uh, this year, and I was stunned to see how many of the, the commercials from the Super Bowl ran longer than a minute. Um, what we're seeing is we're seeing a move towards, instead of simple 30-second commercials to introduce a product, sell the product, and move on, you're seeing these, these essentially branded content spots where uh, the the, the the commercial is designed at creating an emotional engagement with the audience to take us on a, on a two-minute journey to tell a two-minute story and to give us a satisfying ending. And I find that to be really very interesting. Um, I'm going to talk about three commercials ever so quickly uh, that, that I think are really, really uh, important because one of the questions that, that we sort of deal with when, when telling stories is what does uh, a good story look like? Um, you know, how do you tell when you've got a good story? And the reality is that it's very, very hard to figure that out. And often you don't know until, it, until it's finished and people are responding to it whether or not you've done a good job or whether or not it's a good story. But one of the things that I find very interesting is, and I think this is important for for where we are in terms of, um, you know, working with not-for-profits and working with um, sort of non-traditional storytelling uh, entities, is that the the most successful commercials over the last few years, or and I say commercials, it's, it's wrong to call them commercials. The last few, the most successful branded content that I have seen over the last few years have had nothing to do with production value. They've had nothing to do with how much things cost. They have nothing to do with, uh, with anything of that nature, which historically have been sort of benchmarks of good storytelling. What we're seeing more and more of these short, short form uh, branded content is how, I don't want to sort of harp on about the three things I talked about earlier, how clear the messaging is, how specifically targeted to an audience they are, and how, simple the stories are. Because the other thing about the web is that it's a direct link between you, the, the user, and the interface. So, so marketing can be targeted much stronger now towards you specifically, as opposed to on a television show where they, they you know, if you watch, uh, you know, a, co a, a cop detective show, the commercials are very often geared at sort of 
males 18 to 35, because that's the largest demographic that watches cop shows or whatever, you're seeing now more and more because it's you directly interfacing with your own with your own internet, and it has a memory of what you watched. The commercials are getting far more specific and far more synced to you. So I'm going to talk about three spots that I think are incredibly successful uh, uh, storytelling uh, uh, branded content. The first one uh, is a spot called Embrace Life. Um, there's, a, there's a link there for you guys to look at, um, you know, and I do, I do uh, really strongly suggest that if you, if you have a few minutes when we're done, you go and watch these spots. Embrace Life was a PSA that was built uh, by a company in England. They were, they were approached by uh, a, a group called the Sussex uh, Safer Road Society, and they basically said, we want you to make a PSA on uh, – why it's important to wear safety belts. But we don't want you to make a PSA because PSAs never work. We want you to do something completely different. And what follows when you watch it, and, I, and I'm, I'm reticent to talk about this one in particular because giving away anything in the spot will, will ruin the experience, but the, what follows is 90 seconds of spellbinding storytelling. But again, it comes from the three very simple principles. They are very clear on their purpose. They want you to know why it's important to wear safety belts. Yeah? They, have a, they have a very specific audience that they, that they are geared towards, which is ultimately everybody. And I know that, that might sound counterintuitive, but there is, there, is a, there is a simplicity to, and this, this is one of the final point I'm going to get to, there is a simplicity to everything they're trying to do that allows it to be so universal. So they have a very specific goal, where, why you should wear safety belts. They have a very specific audience, everybody, and the story they tell is very simple. It is about a man playing with his family, and he is driving, and then an unexpected twist happens. And the reason why this one is the one I started with is because having worked in production, having, having done stories, at a low budget, I can tell you that this spot was done for hardly any money at all. It cost next to nothing. And yet it is an incredibly compelling, emotive, brilliant piece of storytelling. And it just further proves that if you have a really clear goal in mind, you tell a, a very simple story and you execute it well, that you can really, really affect change. Um, I, again, I, I'm really reticent to talk about this one because it, it really is such a great, a great watch, and I really, I cannot sh recommend strongly that you watch it. And it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, it, uh, as I, you can see there, it, it won a, a Can Leon, which is a big award for advertising. It was, it was a very big hit. Um, the second spot I want to talk about, which I'm sure is probably far more familiar to to uh, a lot of you, uh, is the Dear Sophie spots that that were run by Google and Gmail. And these spots, uh, the, the concept is really very, very simple. Uh, it's a, a father who's just, his wife is just about to give birth, and he opens up uh, a Gmail account for his uh, beersofie at gmail.com, and he writes her an email you know, every day or every other day until she turns 18, and it charts her, the growth from the adorable child that you see on the screen to when she's a, a 16 or 17-year-old uh, girl. And uh, this one is interesting because this is a, this is a sort of, this is not a cheap commercial. It's not an expensive commercial. It, it's somewhere in between. Uh, and it's, again, it's an incredibly effective uh, uh, branded content spot. It's an incredibly effective story because it does, again, the three things. It is a very clear purpose. They want to show you the power, the stability, the lasting power of Gmail, of Google, um, they want to show you uh, how they are at the cutting edge of technological involvement in our lives. It's a really simple concept that they use, that they utilize brilliantly. Um, again, the audience is very clear. It's directed at parents. It's directed at millennials, the sort of 18 to 35-year-olds who are either about to start a family or thinking about having a family. Um, and the story is incredibly simple. Let's just simply show a child getting older. What's incredible about, about this spot and also about the Embrace Life spot is the innovative way 
they do it. If I was to pitch this story to you, I want to do a commercial in which I show a, a small child getting older and how that affects uh, me as the parent. That's not necessarily that interesting or that clever. Yeah? If I then say what I'm going to do is do it through the, the, the prism of my email capacity, of my you know, involvement with, with Google and Gmail and all that, it, all that it has to it, well, now it's elevated slightly. It's, in, it's intriguing. It's an innovative way of telling the story. It's still simple. It's still a clarity of purpose. It's still got an incredibly specific audience. But it is innovative in its approach. The, the third spot I want to talk about, and this is the, the top end, this spot costs lots and lots and lots of money, is uh, I've got it here as the Olympic Mons. It's actually Thank You Mons is the name of the spot. It was run during, as you can tell, during the, the 2012 Olympics by P&G. And um, it's a, a brilliant, brilliant spot about showing four or five different children from being very young. One of them is a, wants to be a runner. One of them wants to be a swimmer. One wants to be a volleyball player. One's a gymnast. Uh, and it just shows you the, um, the different children and how their moms, every step of their lives, they, they wake them up early in the morning. They make them breakfast. They take them to their first practice. When they hurt themselves, they bandage them up. When they, when they fall off the beam, they, they, they help them get, get back on top. You know, they drive them to the various meetings. They help make their costumes. And they basically show you over two and a half minutes or two minutes, these moms interacting with their children, their children get older, their children get bigger, and, of course, the finale is these four or five kids now at the London Olympics winning their events and... Um, Essentially, it, the, the, the backbone to that success is their mum. It is, uh, again, an unbelievably successful story. Uh, it is, uh, uh, again, clarity of purpose. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to say thank you to their mum. Like, literally, that's the title of the spot. That's what the spot's about. It couldn't be clearer. Now, obviously, from the clarity of purpose, who is your audience? Well, that's pretty obvious. It's for moms. Uh, and the simplicity of the story, literally, they're just showing moms helping their children. It's no different in terms of concept to the Baby Steps competition video. This is about parents helping their children. That's what it's, that's its goal. What's amazing, again, is the innovative approach that they take to achieving that goal, which is this, this, is, this is where it gets, you know, Hollywood. They have lots of locations, you know, it's set in Asia. It's set in Asia. It's set in Brazil. It's set in London. You know, it's all over the, all over the world. Um, they have beautifully shot footage. You know, it's a very expensive spot. But the reason why I wanted to show you these three branded content spots in particular is these are three incredibly, incredibly powerful stories. In 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 the, in the question of what what does a good story look like, these three spots look like good stories. They, are, they couldn't be more different if they tried. They couldn't cost different amounts of money if they tried. They couldn't have more different styles if they tried. What they all do share in common is they all know exactly what they're trying to do, who they're trying to reach, and they allow the story to be the dominant factor in the equation. That, for me, is proof in the pudding of how successful stories look. Successful stories look like that. Um, so, you know, for me, it's, it's one of those things where branded content is becoming more and more the norm, I think, for how we're going to receive a lot of the stories that we see. Uh, and for me, the way you make those stories successful is you have to engage your audience in a way that perhaps previously you didn't. Because if we are all moving much more towards a web-based sort of interface with, with how we receive our stories, whilst they can focus those stories much closer to, to us as the user specifically, the issue that they are going to run into is that the web is essentially an infinite space. Unlike television where there are parameters and checks and balances that if you are a, a brand or if you are a, 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 a company, you can you you can essentially pay for your way onto television. The web is an open space that we, as a user, dictate where we want to go. And the reason why I bring that up 
is that in an internet space, finding an audience is incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. And so whilst we look at these three spots, and two of them are massively recognizable brands, you've got Google, which is arguably the most recognizable brand in the world, and P&G, which is very, very famous, the, the very first spot, the Embrace Live spot, is for a regional English safety belt PSA. It couldn't be less glamorous if it tried. But it is incredibly effective and became incredibly popular and, and, and became incredibly uh, uh, famous because it was so well done, because the story was so simple, because its clarity of purpose was so clear, and because they knew exactly who they wanted to watch that spot. And I think that for me, those three as a sort of, uh, uh, sort of sampling of, of the marketplace, if you like, are great examples of how good stories in this sort of branded content era are about, not about cost or about um, name value, they're about connection. And you know, I think that, that, that those are the three sort of key elements, clarity of purpose, know your audience, simplicity of story, that will help tell good stories. The final step that I want to talk about in terms of crafting a good story is uh, the storyteller, which is to say you. Um, very often, uh, you are going to be the lens through which uh, the story is crafted. Now, what do I mean by that? Essentially, as I said earlier, you are very, very rarely writing a story for you. Or, or very rarely are you writing a story in which you are the ultimate uh, yes or no sort of power. Very often you are working with other creatives. You are almost always working for at least one other boss, often multiple bosses. Um, and it's really, really important that you and your point of view are uh, the, the, you, the, you allow your point of view to essentially shape the story itself. Earlier, I mentioned how once you have this, once you have the simplicity of story locked in, you sort of have to get out of the way and allow the story to do what it's got to do. But before that, you have to. It, 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 another, another sort of thing that's very easy to do in the initial stages of crafting a message is to simply try and please everybody around you. Uh, to uh, to if you're working for multiple um, you know directors or if you're working with different sort of branch man your grant funders if you're working with different people who uh, are are important in the process that very often you simply want to make sure that they are happy that what they want is recognised and obviously that's a very important step. But the reason why you are telling the story, why you are the person crafting the message, is because you have a point of view. You have a message that you need to craft. And it is really, really important that you don't lose that. And that's true of anything that you write. It doesn't matter if you're writing a commercial, if you're writing a, a novel, if you're writing a movie. You know, you have to, have to, have to remember that you are the lens through which this story is going to interact with the world. Um, you essentially are the conduit for the story, because without you, it doesn't go anywhere. It simply exists as an idea on a page or in the ethos. You are the one who will turn it into uh, a tangible, uh, watchable, readable, engageable item. Um, and so when I say that you know you as the lens, you shouldn't forget that. I'm not suggesting that you go rogue and ignore you know the people that you're working with and don't listen to to the influences of your to your bosses or your your fellow creators. What I'm saying is, is that you have to recognise when you have you have to recognise when you know in your gut what the story needs to go, where where it needs to go, how it needs to be constructed. Um, Essentially, what I'm trying to do here is reinforce in this, this process that you are a incredibly valuable part of it, of it becoming a, a created uh, 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 existing object. Uh, you know, as a writer, it's very easy to... Um, wh when things go well, uh, you find that the writer is very often the very last person who is thanked. 
Um, I speak from experience. And, uh, you know, it's it's very easy to get lost behind if, you, if you're making a, a sort of commercial, the director takes all the praise or, or the product itself gets, oh, that's a great, that's a great spot by Google. Um, you know, nobody ever thinks, wow, who wrote that spot for Google? Uh, the, the reason why I'm sort of bringing this up is because you, you have to recognize that as the conduit between the, the item that you are trying to sell, and I don't mean that to mean to be sort of marketing or advertising, but no matter what you are doing, no matter if you're writing a script, novel, a commercial, whatever you're writing, you are selling either a concept or a brand or a, a very specific um, object, but your job is to sell the story to the audience. Um, and so it's really very, very important that you don't ever forget that, that you allow who you are and the experiences that you've had and the influences that you, you exert to, to shape the story. Um, it's a really hard thing to do. It's a really hard thing to learn. But it's something that as you're going forward, you, sh you shouldn't really ever, ever stop. Uh, you shouldn't ever lose sight of that. Um, so that is sort of a sort of, for me, that's sort of like a, a, an overview of how the process that we go through at Bertie Robert to sort of craft these short form stories that, that we do. Um, I, I think that sort of pretty much covers the sort of the, the, the overview of it. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like so just to recap ever so quickly, uh, I've said it a hundred times, so I'm sure I'm sure it's pretty locked in. Very first step, clarity of purpose. You've got to make sure that all the various interests are on the same page, that there is an agreement on what the message is going to be, on what the story is going to be. Because once you've got that clarity, it's really easy to find who it is who's going to watch these, these spots, who's going to read this novel, who's going to whatever it might be. Once you have the clarity of purpose and the audience in mind, the next important step is the simplicity of the story. Do not allow the story to get complicated. You can tell it in an innovative way, but you can't allow the story itself to become too complicated. Because when you do that, you are robbing the story of its power. You are robbing the story of, you aren't trusting the story to do what it's there to do, which is engage an audience. Once you've got those three things, you have to sort of take a step back and allow the story to do its job. Before you do any of that, the very, very first thing is remember that you have to embrace that you are the lens through which this message is being crafted, that your point of view, your voice is critical to the success overall of how a story is shaped. Um, and those are sort of like the big, the big things for us. Thank you so much, Matt. That was really informative. Um, and you brought some um, really great examples of effective storytelling to the table today. Um, those of you in the audience, do take the time to watch a few of those clips when you receive the post-event email later today. They are really good and very um, thought-provoking and heartstring tugging. Um, and, and, and that banner film, Matt, your team really did an amazing job with that. It's, it's quite moving and really gets at the heart of what the Baby Steps campaign is all about. Um, so now I'd like to speak, you know, uh, quickly in the time we have left to why digital storytelling. Um, Matt, as you started to get at it earlier, um, for me the most obvious answer is that you know, we are visual creatures. Um, and as we saw in the banner film, stories are moving. Um, that's just how we experience and process life. Um, you know, how did social media become the Goliath it is today? <laughs> it's really simple. Uh, photos and videos are extremely engaging, um, and people want to see them. Um, as I mentioned before, stories are the currency of community. Um, and really, any Instagram feed is testament to that, right? Um, you know, we follow people we don't know personally, but feel like we know them intimately. Um, we photograph breakfast, um, road signs, sunsets, moments, spent playing and learning with our children, championship moments. These are the things that really matter to us. So um, it's these moments that are sort of the timestamps of our lives that show we accomplish things in life. Um, but as Matt pointed out, uh, without a storyteller to make sense of those random moments, those moments are static. You know, they're fixed in a moment in time. 
Um, as a storyteller for your organization, your challenge is to capture and consider the many images around us and, and arrange them in an order that speaks to your audience um, to inspire others to get involved in your mission. Technology has really made it possible to capture and share many of those um, moments in an instant really, and oftentimes to a widespread and distributed audience. Um, you know, many of us have gone mobile to capture and engage with the rest of the world. Um, nowadays, you don't necessarily need to um, put aside a huge budget or go all out to start telling stories. I mean, bless your heart <laughs> if you get to work with some of the best of the best like Matt and the Dirty Rubber team. But um, I mean, you know, there are many positive reasons to work with professionals. Um, but I do want to stress the idea of um, starting within reach. Um, just start somewhere by taking the inventory of the technology at your disposal right now. Um, you know, if that's um, you know, purchasing a few apps for your smartphone, think about putting aside a small budget for a handheld device or a flip camera. Just take a manageable baby step towards digital production. You can, you know, um, start by interviewing your community or donor members at your next conference using your smartphone. You can record technology events live and publish to YouTube directly with um, the, an app called YouTube Capture for example. Um, there are many ways that you can start um, telling your own stories now. Um, there, are sto you know, there are opportunities for storytelling everywhere all around us. Um, curating that and funneling it back to the community you serve ultimately fosters trust and mutual respect between funders, donors, board members, and community members. Um, I would encourage you all to think about ways to transform um, content that you already produce, um, whether those are case studies, data sets, maps, timelines, charts. Transform those into opportunities for storytelling. Ask questions. Get out there and spotlight members of your community doing interesting things. Capture clips um, at conferences and use them as assets on social media in your reports and proposals. So, you know, um, I, the, the storytelling really is at the core of what we do. Um, it should be incorporated into um, you know, ways we communicate with each other on social media in the work that we are already producing um, as um, nonprofits, libraries, and charities. And um, storytelling really builds community and opens doors, opens opportunities for conversation, and really is a powerful medium. Um, I'd like to now open the floor for um, questions um, directed towards Matt or myself. Um, if the audience um, has any questions at this time, um, we'll take it now. But I did want to go ahead and thank you all for joining us today. Especially thanks to Matt um, for being <laughs> an amazing presenter and to his team, um, as well as everyone else involved in making this webinar possible, um, especially our uh, platform sponsor, ReadyTalk. Um, and it, it, we do have one question um, for you, Matt, it, before we wrap it up here today. Um, the question is, you know, what inexpensive equipment would you recommend for capturing stories outside of, you know, the the few apps I mentioned or, you know, your smartphone? What's your what's your go-to recommendation for inexpensive equipment? Um, are you talking about um, writing uh, software or something? Are you talking about cameras? No, just camera, just for uh, capturing the story specifically. Right, right. right. Um, honestly, the the um, there is a camera called the, the 5D. It's a Canon uh, camera. It is the industry standard sort of go-to uh, low-budget camera. I, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly how much it costs. But the great thing about the 5D 
is that it um, is relatively inexpensive to purchase, which is obviously critical. But it also it works with if 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 you ever get lucky enough to have the money to get to, to rent the big the fancy lenses, um, they all work on the 5D. But it's not it's not necessary to have them. Um, and so for me, if you're talking about hey, what could I go and buy right now that I could then use uh, right now to make something, a 5D would 100% be my answer. Um, that said, um, I've, just, uh, I've been looking at the specs of the new camera on the, um, the new iPhone, and I've got to say that, that the new iPhone camera is pretty spectacular as well. Um, so I would say that those, those are you know, the, two, the two sort of everyday objects that you could buy to really start capturing uh, footage and, and start telling stories. Great. Thanks so much. Do you have any um, recommendations on apps in particular or apps that you personally use to kind of capture and share quickly small clips or um I, you know I don't I don't have what well, you know I uh what I use is there's a there's a app called Snapseed which is um uh a free app for it has filters and it allows you to basically do very simple uh uh uh, uh Photoshop-esque things to your image. Um, Snapseed also has a, um, uh, a video component, which I, the name is escaping me as I, as, I, as, I, as I think about it. But there is a, there is a, a similar thing that you can add filters and, and, and color effects and stuff like that to your video f uh, clips. And it's a very, very uh, involved app. Like you can literally pick specific parts of the frame that you want to be saturated, and then another part to be desaturated, and, and stuff like that. So it's it's a really cool. it's a really great great uh, app. Great. In the last three minutes that we have, um, one last question, um, and that is really, <clears throat> you know, how do nonprofits? go go out there and convince funders to provide support for storytelling um in a way that shows dollars and cents um you know and and ha and that their project actually has benefit to the community how do you that, how do you that, make that pitch to a funder yeah yeah and that's 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 a great i mean that is a million dollar question um how do you get how do you go to somebody and, and get them to agree to to fund something um you know for me it's 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 the simplest thing I can say to you, honestly, is it's about two things. There is no better way of getting people involved in whatever you're doing, getting an engaged audience, than telling a story. It's very, very simple. It's a fact. It's, I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. But for me, the, the critical thing that you have to do when you're engaging, when you're talking to funders, is my experience, nine times out of ten, is the two things they they care about are your passion, right? They want because again, you are the person telling the story, so they really care that you care, uh, and they uh, they want to know that they're they're going to have the widest reach possible. And that goes back to nothing gets an audience quicker, and nothing gets a bigger audience than a brilliantly crafted story. And again, I would just re uh, reemphasize that Embrace Life commercial uh, was done for next to nothing for a regional PSA, and it's gotten 30 million views on YouTube and won countless awards. So that right there is proof in the body. And that one in particular is such a great, great um, clip. <laughs> it's really, it really it's tugs at your heartstrings. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks again to you, Matt, um, for being super stellar. And um, I, I wanted to thank you all again for joining us today. Um, we hope you'll join us again on December 12th, same time, for our next webinar in this Baby Step series, um, where we're very excited to discuss um, sewing stories from your community, what goes into the process of pre-production before you push record um, in capturing mm -hmm. your story. Um, so thank you so much, Matt. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.